All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Abdul Karim Mudiman, one of the pulmonary sleep critical care attendings. I was asked to talk about parasomnias today. Um, I'll try to keep it as interesting as possible. A lot of it is theory. Um, there's not a lot of videos I was able to pull up because of patient IDs on them, but um, I've got some YouTube videos that we can get through. Um, I have no disclosures. Some of the slides, especially the polysomnogram pages, were borrowed from the uh, American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, uh, resource website. Um, our objectives, topics for today, we'll start off with a, with a small uh, clinical case and a brief introduction to parasomnias. We'll define uh, parasomnias based on uh, the diagnostic criteria according to the uh, International Classification of uh, Sleep Disorders. Um, and uh, a little bit of epidemiology, pathophysiology, diagnostic eval, followed by treatment strategies for each parasomnias. We'll go through both uh, non-REM as well as REM parasomnias. Start off with a case, 29-year-old um, gentleman with history of um, depression comes to clinic with complaints of sleepwalking. Symptoms have been more frequent this winter, 67 times since November. It occurred three times during one week. Significant other noted that he had walked out of the house and was found to be standing next to the swimming pool. Patient states that he's not able to recollect any of these events and realizes only when she wakes him up. The doors now have alarms so that if he tries to open them, it wakes him up. Events occur in the first half of the night, predominantly around two in the morning. In terms of uh, further history, um, he does report restless sleep and frequent nocturnal awakenings, um, does not have any symptoms of uh, sleep-related breathing disorders, such as snoring, apneas, et cetera. Um, he does report fatigue, poor concentration, daytime sleepiness. Um, otherwise, um, uh, he's able to, uh, you know, uh, perform at work. Um, no other significant uh, behavioral abnormalities apart from sleepwalking. More HPI, looking through his sleep hygiene, goes to bed around 10 o'clock, sits with his phone, and then falls asleep after 11. So sleep latency varies anywhere from 30 to 30 minutes to, one, to 60 minutes. Wakes up at 6.30 in the morning and um, wakes up with an alarm clock without difficulty. Total sleep time is about five to six hours, and uh, he does not nap. His bedtime and his total sleep hours do increase on weekends when he is off. He's not on any prescribed medications. Even for his depression, he's not on anything currently. Has tried Benadryl and over-the-counter melatonin without any effect. Um, there was some reports that he was taking Ambien. However, patients declined taking any of that in the recent months. Um, his vitals are unremarkable, and um, his oropharyngeal exam is, is, is within the norm. Um, data review, stop bang is only two. His Epworth sleep in the scale is 11, which suggests that he is uh, sleepy. What's the most likely diagnosis? <laughs> There's actually a reason I put that in there. <laughs> it's actually insufficient sleep syndrome. Um, and to go through it, uh, obviously it doesn't really report any symptoms of sleep apnea. Uh, patients with sleep apnea do have fragmented sleep. They're at risk for uh, parasomnias. And uh, what he's having is more of a non-REM parasomnia and not a REM parasomnia, especially because he doesn't recollect what's going on. Usually sleepwalking is associated with non-REM and M3 sleep. Um, adverse effects of sedatives. Um, the reason I threw that option there is because of this questionable history of ambient usage, and it's tested in boards, um, drugs such as Zolpidem, and then two sister drugs, uh, Esopaclone as well as Zaloplon are uh, uh, are known to contribute or cause sleepwalking, sleep eating, and do all these complex behaviors at night. And ICU floater can cause circadian rhythm, but you're only you're only working for about two weeks, right? Dr. Tatum's nice enough that you know you're not in the ICU longer than that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, introduction for parasomnias. And we know parasomnia is just abnormal, abnormal behaviors when they're sleeping. So to define it more accurately and precisely, group of sleep disorders that are characterized by abnormal, unpleasant motor, verbal, or behavioral events that occur during sleep or wake to sleep transitions. And as you can see in this diagram, this picture here, you've got um, wake, non-REM, and sleep. Usually um, the parasomnias occur when there's an overlap between wake and one of the sleep stages. Very rarely could it occur during um, uh, both. A patient can have non-REM as well as REM. Um, if it does, then it's called an overlap syndrome, and it's usually not that common. Uh, to uh, recap, in terms of stages of sleep, you guys may know there's N1, N2, N3, and REM. Previously, uh, N3 was known as stage three and four. Um, however, that's been changed. This is a histogram of a, uh, uh, a characteristic of, 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 uh, some, of someone's of normal person's sleep architecture. And we'll come back to this slide again later. But um, if you notice here in, in the one in the histogram up top, it's the one for children. There's not a whole lot of REM compared to adults. However, there is a significant chunk of the night where they spend in N3 sleep. Here it's noted as three and four compared to adults where N3 sort of is, is, not, is not the big uh, player. Typically after puberty, that's when N3 starts fading away and eventually in your 30s or 40s, you don't really have much N3 sleep. And most of the non-REM parasomnias occurs in N3 sleep. The three states are wake, wakefulness, non-REM, and REM. Not to go into too much of neurophysiology because it's obviously not very pertinent for you guys, but um, in terms of what controls wakefulness, uh, the neurotransmitters are 5-HT, dopamine, and norepinephrine. These are found to be elevated or increased. The ascending reticular activating system along with the dorsal raphae and locus ceruleus um, um, help uh, in terms of uh, promoting wakefulness. With regards to non-REM, um, interleukin-1 beta is increased. GABA, histamine, and adenosine are, are the big players. GABA is an uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter, as you guys know. Histamine inhibits non-REM, which is why antihistamines, especially the first generation, such as Benadryl, can promote uh, sleep. Adenosine um, promotes NREM, non-REM sleep. Caffeine inhibits that, which is why, you know, most patients stay awake after caffeine. And... Um, there's a lot of uh, cholinergic activity going on during REM sleep. So non-REM parasomnias are more common in children and young adults. Um, it's very rare that they occur um, in the elderly unless they are uh, on specific medications or underlying uh, uh, sleep uh, disorder. Uh, REM, REM parasomnias occur more commonly in adults and the elderly. There's, there's three different kinds of uh, REM parasomnias. One is REM behavioral disorder, and then isolated sleep paralysis and nightmare disorder. Uh, this is a list of all the parasomnias. We'll try to cover most of it, which is pertinent for adult medicine. Uh, we'll probably skip, skip through sleep enuresis, which is not really uh, that pertinent for, for, um, for you guys here. Um, so non-REM parasomnias um, is uh, parasomnias that occur during uh, non-REM sleep. And um, typically patients have complex, they are able to do complex motor activities, talking, um, walking um, during their sleep, and some to an extent even driving. Uh, three main uh, non-REM non parasomnias are confusional arousals, pretty benign, sleepwalking, sleep terrors, and then lastly, sleep-related eating disorder. Pathophysiology, um, it's presumed to be because um, there is either uh, uh, an issue in terms of maturation of your sleep, which can occur in, in, in uh, infants predominantly. Um, there's some sort of a dissociation between uh, wakefulness and, state and, and sleep. Um, most of it occurs in N3, which is your sort of deeper form of sleep in, non -rem, um, in the non-REM uh, stages. And as I said, most of these parasomnias that occur in non-REM are benign and they tend to go away um, with age. The, uh, the diagnostic criteria for non-REM parasomnia based on the ICSD-3 is you've got to meet all five of these criteria. One, recurrent episodes or of incomplete awakenings, inappropriate or absent responses to others, limited or no associate cognition or dream imagery, so they can't really recollect what ha what's happening. 
uh, partial or complete amnesia. Disturbance is not explained by any other disorder or substance abuse. So the three main ones, uh, confusion, arousal, sleepwalking, and sleep terrors, um, they're more prevalent in, in children than adults, um, out of which uh, sleepwalking is probably uh, the most common symptoms, or that's what patients usually come into the clinic with uh, because their, their kids are walking or will be getting out of bed. So start off with confusional arousal is the most benign thing for those who have toddlers at home. You have a camera, you can see them smile, you can see them like moan, say stuff, or just wake up and go back to bed. That's typically what a confusional arousal is. Um, so in order to uh, diagnose someone with confusional arousal, you got to meet uh, the general criteria followed by uh, episodes by mental confusion or confused behavior that occurs while the patient is in bed. It's key that they're, they're in bed and they're not out of bed and there's no terror. Um, and um, that's what differentiates night terrors from confusional arousals. Milder, milder uh, phenotype than the other non-REM parasomnias, they're in bed and the patient's usually not agitated. They wake up and they go back to bed, don't even recollect that it happened. Uh, more common in children less than uh, five years of age. Could it occur in adults? It can, um, and uh, particularly in those that have fragmented sleep or sleep deprivation. Uh, sexomnia is a variant of uh, confusional arousals. The reason I put this here is because most of the medical legal aspect of it um, is uh, a lot of offenders try to use this as a, a loophole to get away from whatever they're charged from. Um, however, uh, there's nothing that's going to prove, even if you do a polysomnogram and the patient does have it, it's not going to prove that this is what happened on that particular um, night. So um, there's a lot more input from forensic as opposed to uh, a sleep physician when it comes to uh, this disorder. Sleepwalking. Um, once again, the, you got to meet criteria for, for uh, a non-REM parasomnia, and the arousals are associated with ambulation and other complex behaviors out of bed. So patients must leave the bed, and um, they're usually calm, but times they can be aggressive, and they're able to do complex behaviors, unlock doors, drive cars, operate appliances, microwave, refrigerator, get hold of like knives and things like that. So um, it is, it, it can be scary and dangerous at the same time. And should you wake up a sleepwalker? <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to wake them up because you know, they don't really know what's going on. And if you wake them up, they can freak out and they can become aggressive and violent. So the, the least you should do is just redirect them calmly and gently for them to go back to bed um, and uh, as opposed to waking them up as rigorously and trying to tell them what they're doing. Um, sleep terrors. Um, so <clears throat> another non-REM parasomnia, arousals are characterized by abrupt terror, typically beginning with an alarming vocalization, a scream, intense fear with autonomic arousal. Um, very common in, uh, in kids. They start off <clears throat> screaming, and these episodes may last longer than about five minutes, usually 20 to 30 minutes, sometimes even longer. They're inconsolable when this occurs, um, and uh, it's scary for the parents for the most of the time. And um, However, it's, it's benign, and it, it, it does not recur as uh, often as uh, um, people perceive it to be. So the behavioral patterns between the three parasomnias we just discussed. Um, confusional arousal is probably the most benign. All there is is just an arousal a few minutes and then that's about it, maybe even a few seconds. Um, sleepwalking, there is more motor activity. However, they have no form of uh, emotional distress, whereas with sleep terror, there's a significant amount of distress that occurs to both um, the child as well as uh, the parents. Triggers. Um, so it could be either related to fragmented sleep or factors that deepen sleep and increase sleep inertia. So if you sleep deprive an individual, for example, if you're sleep deprived from being on call for about a week and you go sleep for a good week, you're not gonna regain REM sleep. What you're gonna gain back is more of N3. Um, so you are prone for developing these parasomnias. Um, and the sleep deprivation or fragmentation could be related to an underlying sleep-related breathing disorder, for example, like obstructive sleep apnea or it can be related to periodic limb movements that's contributing to awakenings at night. Um, fever is more so for, ch for children as opposed to adults. 
and um, traveling to an unfamiliar area can also provoke these parasomnias. Medications, as we discussed, uh, sedative hypnotics, mainly ambient class of drugs, lithium and uh, anticholinergics to some extent. So how do you evaluate these patients? Obviously, history and physical is key um, in terms of diagnosing. A lot of times they're coming to clinic, they're bringing a video. Um, nowadays, they, shoot, they, they bring videos of people snoring. So if, if someone's walking or doing something abnormal, um, they're, they're, they're bringing videos of what's actually going on, which kind of helps. Um, you'd want to do a polysomnography, um, not to diagnose the parasomnia, because these events don't really occur on a nightly basis, right? So it's more so to rule out other disorders. Uh, if you catch them doing something, well and good, but um, it's more so to rule out OSA, periodic limb movements, seizures that can sort of be, a dif be in the differentials um, um, for these patients. So <clears throat> this is the 90-second uh, epic, 90-second uh, uh, polysomnogram. So there's three epics together. And um, I don't want to confuse you guys, but if you look at the center or the second half of the page, the patient's awake. There's a lot more stuff going on, right? More and more activity in the EEG. And um, I don't see, yeah, you can see my cursor. And then these are your, um, your limb leads over here. Um, so there's definitely um, uh, muscle tone uh, in this individual. If you look at the first third or first half of the, of the, of the, of the polysomnogram, this is characteristic of stage N3, slow wave sleep. Um, these are delta waves. Um, they are high amplitude, low frequency, 0 0.5 to 4, or 0.5 to 4 hertz. And um, as you notice, patients in sleep N3, and then there's a, there's an arousal, or the patient's awake over here, and then goes back to sleep for a short while over here, and then followed by another arousal. And what's key here is if you look down below, I know these are not labeled here, but this is your chest and, and abdomen belts. These are your pressure and thermistor sensors, which is, which is helpful in determining if they're having any sort of uh, an obstructive event or respiratory event. There isn't really a significant drop in the flows um, for, for to, to, you know, to say that this is a, a hypopnea or an apneic event. Um, patients asleep, there is, they're starting to have muscle tone over here. Eventually, they wake up. And, uh, and then they go back to sleep and then wake up again. This in conjunction with you know, a video um, would help you diagnose what exactly is going on, whether they're just waking up confused or are they actually uh, doing more complex uh, behaviors um, at night. So differentials, uh, RBD, REM behavioral disorder, sleep-related epilepsy, malingering, <clears throat> and alcohol intoxication. The main thing is obviously amongst those that the most harmful is epilepsy. Um, and uh, the major differentiating feature between parasomnias and epilepsy is uh, epilepsy is more repetitive, stereotypic occurs almost on a nightly basis, whereas parasomnias don't really occur on a nightly basis. Even if they do, maybe once doesn't occur more than once a night. General treatment strategies. The first one is actually safety measures that you want to discuss uh, about with patients. Um, make sure that you know the furnitures are padded. There are no sharp objects within within the within the room. Um, lock the doors if needed. Door alarms. Make sure they're securing guns and other weapons. Um, and uh, it's it's mainly uh, safety. And then you want to make sure if this patient's actually having um, deprived sleep, such as in the earlier case, insufficient sleep syndrome. You'd want to do that by using a sleep diary or an actigraphy and history. And uh, if there is an under underlying uh, breathing disorder, then you'd want to treat that. So usually non-pharmacological treatments is the main mainstay um, for treatment of non-REM parasomnia because most of the time it's benign. Um, if there is um, uh, some, if there is uh, kids that are waking up and walking, you, and if there's a specific pattern to it, then um, you could potentially wake them up about half an hour before these events occur um, for a good couple of weeks um, to see if they respond or not. If there's an underlying stressor, um, especially in adults, then uh, psychotherapy hypnosis uh, has been proven to help. So with regards to pharmacotherapy, like I said, we rarely use this for uh, non-REM parasomnias, but if there's one thing that I want you guys to take away from uh, treatment in terms of medications is uh, clonazepam. That's probably the only drug that would work across for almost all these disorders, um, and uh, TCAs to an extent. Whether it's, so clonazepam works whether it's REM or non-REM uh, 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 parasomnia. 
So come into sleep-related eating disorder, otherwise known as sleep eating. So basically they're waking up and they're eating um, at night. Um, and a lot of times there's a precursor where they're actually walking and then they develop sleep eating. Um, and a lot of times that's what occurs. So in order, the diagnostic criteria is they're, 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 they've got recurrent episodes of dysfunctional eating after an arousal and one or more of the following five, consumption of peculiar form of food, cat food, coffee beans, things like that. Um, uh, sleep-related injurious or potential injurious behaviors, adverse health outcomes like um, weight gain, um, partial or complete loss of consciousness, and, and the lastly, it's not, it's not really explained by any other uh, underlying sleep or mental disorder. Estimated 5% prevalence in college, college age adults. Um, for some reason, majority is female. We don't know why. Um, not that the sleep characteristic architecture is any different between males and females. Um, age onset, 22 to 33, it's, it doesn't really occur in uh, the elderly unless you are prescribing them a medication that's provoking them to do it. Um, eating is involuntary and out of control. Um, this is another polysomnogram where um, their patient is an N3 and then they wake up and carry on to do what they're doing. And um, yeah, I don't know if it's got to do with the dreams that, that they have during non-REM sleep, but the, the, the food they choose is usually not what you'd want to eat. Um, cat food, butter, raw eggs, um, and high-calorie high uh, food. Um, what's, what's concerning is, you know, there can be a lot of injury that can occur. Sometimes they could essentially uh, turn on the stove and, and, you know, put their hands on it and, and, and harm themselves. So um, that's, that's what's concerning in patients with sleep eating. Um, and like I said, the most commonly tested one is Ambien. So um, you could potentially have a one-line question in your pulmonary boards. I don't know why they would, but sometimes they do. <laughs> and um, Ambien or any of the other two drugs I mentioned earlier can result in uh, sleepwalking. Um, course is usually unremitting, unfortunately. And um, like I said, it, it, it kind of intertwines. There's two basic drive states, eating and sleeping. Um, and uh, PSG is not really needed unless you want to rule out other disorders. Treatment, again, safety, protection. There are no uh, randomized control trials for, for, uh, to, to, to find out if you know, there's any medication that, that works. Based on anecdotal information, SSRIs um, are usually the first line um, for, for this. But, Almost always, there's an underlying um, sleep disorder or a medication, an offending agent that you know once you stop it, um, it'll go away. Um, from my practice, that's basically what um, I've had. I've seen a lot of patients on Ambien who come in with, uh, you know, sleepwalking or sleep. Sleep. Uh, they've actually got into the car before the families have caught them. So um, I don't know if it's boring, but we'll go through a YouTube video. Is this being? Do you know if this one's being shared? Okay. My bad. We need to get YouTube premium. Yeah. <laughs> <You're too cheap. laughs> um, so Hollywood actually made a. Uh, I don't know if the audio is turned off, but uh, it's like it's just not okay. So, so basically, he's waking up, and um, he's not walking like a normal person, and he's doing uh, behaviors that is you probably not something he would do when he's awake. And uh, if the audio, if you probably can hear it, he's he's saying nonsensical stuff when he's when he's speaking, and um, yep. Coffee. <laughs> they can get very aggressive, um, and you know it, they're not just doing this for for a comedy, but it's actually uh, um, real. It can happen in some individuals. They can get very aggressive. All right, back to our PowerPoint. 
So we'll move on to REM-related parasomnias. So undesired, undesired behaviors that occur during REM sleep. <clears throat> There's two distinctive fe features that occur during REM sleep, vivid dreams and loss of muscle tone. It's not that you can't dream during non-REM sleep. The, the, the thalamus, as you guys know, is sort of the relay for the cortex. It kind of shuts off, which is why um, when you dream during a non-REM sleep, there's nothing transmitted for you to even recollect. Whereas during REM sleep, um, you know, you could you could pretty much tell exactly what happened because the thalamus is activated at that point in time. And there's two muscles, there's only two muscles that are working. Otherwise, you're essentially paralyzed during REM sleep. Those two muscles are extraocular as well as your diaphragm. So coming back to this histogram, um, the reason I put this back here is in, you know, as I mentioned, REM, REM parasomnias occur more in adults because there's more REM, consolidated REM sleep in these individuals and there's not a whole lot of M3. So the most common REM parasomnias, as I mentioned, three, REM behavioral disorder, um, acting out dreams is typically the presenting symptoms. Um, and then sleep-related paralysis, inability to wake up um, or inability to move either from waking up or, or while going to bed, and a nightmare disorder. So the diagnostic criteria for REM behavioral disorder, <clears throat> repeated episodes of sleep-related vocalization and or complex motor behaviors. These behaviors are documented by polysomnogram, um, whereas you know with your uh, non-REM parasomnias, that wasn't really the case. Um, and uh, PSG dem demonstrates REM sleep without atonia. That's mainly what we're looking for when we're doing PSGs in patients who have, been, who have dream enactments. And the disturbance is not explained by any other underlying sleep disorder. So <clears throat> loss of physiological aton atonia during REM is the basis of RBD. Um, normally, um, you know, protective inhibitory mechanism precludes acting out dreams um, that may pose a risk for injury to the patient and bed partner. Typically, patients have vivid dreams, um, and um, they, they do complex behaviors in bed. They rarely get out of bed to walk or do anything crazy. It's more so in bed. If anything, they could potentially fall off the bed. And you know, once they're up, they know, they know exactly what happened. Um, so uh, you know, there's two, two uh, uh, a dual system that, that uh, innervates your um, uh, muscle activity in the body, in the midbrain your red nucleus, and then uh, your inhibitory mechanism by the uh, sublateral dorsal nu nucleus and the subceruleus. So this, along with the VMM, inhibits uh, muscle activity. So uh, in, uh, in patients who, you know, there, there's essentially GABA here that's inhibiting it. So when you when you're want to treat someone who's got um, uh, a lack of this, if they've got any problems here, for example, uh, neurological problems like Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, they've got, um, you know, uh, uh, a pathology in, in this portion of their brain, so there's not much of an inhibitory mechanism here to contribute to REM atonia. Um, so in those individuals, you would want to treat them with um, uh, a GABA agonist such as a benzo. Polysomnogram findings in, uh, in, REM, uh, behavioral in uh, REM behavioral disorder. So there's two kinds. You could either have a tonic or a phasic. Tonic is when there's sustained more than 50% of the page, there's sustained muscle activity during REM sleep. Phasic is, you know, it, it's split and it's not continuous throughout the whole polysomnogram. Um, and if you look at this uh, polysomnogram here, there's significant activity in the chin. And the, and the arms here, um, and this is REM sleep because there is actually ocular movements here. I'm going to skip through this because it's not pertinent. So medications associated with REM behavioral disorders, SSRIs, SNRIs, they, they can contribute to REM suppression as well as um, REM behavioral disorder. TCAs as well, and then to some extent, beta blockers, mainly atenolol, and uh, also metazapine. So <clears throat> there's a lot of evidence that, um, that, that shows that in patients who have idiopathic REM behavioral disorder, um, tend to develop neurodegenerative chain diseases, such as Parkinson's, Lewy body, multiple system atrophy. And um, you know, uh, a lot of times it's a precursor, and it can occur as early as 10, 10 years in advance. 
So treatment of RBD, once again, injury prevention is key, similar to your other parasomnia. And um, in terms of medications, melatonin is actually your first line of drug. Um, and you'd want to use anywhere from three to five milligrams um, for these patients. The maximum dose usually you'd want to go up to is 15 milligrams nightly. Um, if, if they fail melatonin, then uh, your drug of choice is uh, clonazepam. Recurrent isolated sleep paralysis. So <clears throat> this is, um, uh, some of you guys have rotated through sleep. We always talk about hypnagogic and hypnopompic uh, uh, hallucinations and, um, you know, uh, uh, paralysis. This essentially occurs during either sleep to wake or wake to sleep, where they feel like they're not able to move at all. Um, we don't know exactly why this occurs, but it has been associated with um, patients with narcolepsy at times. So someone's come in with like excessive daytime sleepiness and they're reporting isolated sleep paralysis, then narcolepsy should be in your uh, differential. Treatment, unless if it's an underlying uh, <clears throat> hypersomnia, you just want to reassure and, um, you know, eventually it'll get better. Nightmares. We all know what nightmares are, but there is a diagnostic criteria for nightmare. Uh, repeated occurrence, extremely dysphoric, unpleasant um, uh, dreams that they experience um, is essentially what nightmares are. And uh, the key differentiating feature between nightmares and night terrors is sometimes they, it can get confusing. Night terrors occur during non-REM, nightmares occur during REM sleep. And once they're awake, they've got rapid alertness and they're able to recollect exactly what happened during the night. More prevalent in, in children um, and uh, it tends to go away after puberty. It can occur in adults, um, but a lot of times there is an underlying um, behavioral health problem or stressors in life that is contributing to it. Um, there are medications um, that are available to treat these individuals with nightmares. Um, trazodone is, is usually a uh, first line for these individuals um, because it helps with underlying anxiety, depression disorder, as well as, you know, helps them uh, sleep. So we'll take a look at this video um, for our video. Hopefully there's no, there's no ads this time. So he's actually in sleep and uh, he's trying to punch or box someone and stab someone, yeah. And all of this is actually happening during REM sleep. I'm probably gonna skip because the audio is not clear. It's not, are you guys able to hear anything? Yeah, so we'll probably just hold off. But that's typically what your RBD so other parasomnia, um, <coughs> exploding head syndrome. <laughs> so usual, un it's very unusual and it's underreported. So uh, because it's underreported, we don't really have like you know incidents and, and prevalence in, the, in these in these uh, in this disorder. Sudden noise, like a pistol shot that occurs. Um, and sense of explosion occurring at the wake sleep transition. And um, they, when they're awake, some may have a sense of fright or some may feel all right. Um, and there is no pain or anything. Um, it's, 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 it's a very benign uh, symptom that they have. Um, it can occur during REM or non-REM sleep, <clears throat> which is why it doesn't fall under either or. Um, and they can have autonomic symptoms um, when they wake up. It's very, it's, 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 it's aware, like I said, the prevalence is difficult to determine. Um, there's, it's, it's unknown why this occurs. And uh, sometimes it's thought to be a, a variant of hypnic jerk, that jerking sensation that occurs when, you know, when you're waking up or when you're going to bed. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 a very, it's a very rare disorder. The, the, main, the key aspect is you wanna make sure that you're ruling out other uh, uh, headaches or any other uh, uh, disorders that they can potentially have. Um, namely, the main thing that you don't want to miss is seizures in these individuals. Um, you don't treat it, you just reassure them. Uh, make sure you rule out the other stuff and, um, uh, you know, just reassurances is the mainstay of treatment. 
sleep-related hallucination, <clears throat> sensory perception that has a compelling sense of reality or a true perception that, that occurs without external stimulation or of, of the re relevant sensory organ. Um, you know, typically just like your uh, hypnic jerks uh, or the paralysis that occur going to sleep or waking up from sleep, that's when you know your hallucinations can occur. Um, once again, uh, we, we don't know why this occurs. Um, it is highly uh, uh, prevalent in, um, in women than men. And uh, there is no specific evaluation or diagnostic methods. It's purely clinical. And uh, you want to rule out other, other underlying sleep-related breathing disorders. And uh, just reassure them there's no real pharmacotherapy for this. We touched upon this earlier, <clears throat> but um, you know, uh, parasomnias that occur due to medications. Um, I've got a table here that can, you know, that these are the common offending agents. For your boards, the only thing they could potentially test is usually the, the Ambien, the Zolpidem. Um, SSRIs can can do it as well, <clears throat> but typically Ambien's what they what they test. To an extent, beta blockers more propranolol, which we don't really use that often now. That's what's been shown to contribute to uh, parasomnias. Somniloquy, sleep talking. <clears throat> Another isolated variant, uh, isolated symptom or, or a normal variant. Um, it, can, it can vary in terms of uh, severity. They could just mumble, moan, or they could you know, actually say something, but it doesn't really make sense. Um, I'm sure each one of us is talking our sleep throughout our lives. Um, prevalence is as high as 66%. So um, there's no gender difference between uh, male or female <clears throat> when it comes to sleep talking. Commonly occurs in childhood, can tend to persist longer. Um, they're you know, often idiopathic. It can be associated with an underlying RBD or, or other forms of uh, non-REM parasomnias like confusional arousals, um, and sometimes with seizures as well. Like I mentioned, it can occur in either or, or both, non-REM and, and REM sleep. More so, it's disturbing the partner, whoever's in bed with them. Um, so you want to identify <clears throat> any underlying uh, sleep disorder that's contributing to fragmented sleep and treat that. Um, otherwise, it's mainly reassurance that there's no real medications. Yeah, I don't know if you have the answer, A lot of times, especially in these patients who are vented, um, you don't know what their circadian rhythm is like anymore because you know because you're sedating them, yeah. and that's why they go into delirium because they don't know what day and night is. Which is why I believe it was John Hopkins or Mayo they started doing a melatonin um, for these individuals. Um, but a lot of other hospitals tended to catch on it and use it more like a sedative hypnotic. Unfortunately, melatonin doesn't work that way. <clears throat> so if anything, it can help uh, adjust your circadian rhythm. But if you're not really timing it right, it can, it can worsen your circadian rhythm even further. Um, so uh, it, you know, there, those, it's hard to assess uh, in those individuals because, again, there's no way you're going to be able to do a trial. You can't do sleep studies on these individuals. You don't really know what their EEG activity is, is like. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, levofed itself can contribute to uh, insomnia to, to, to an extent. We're also sedating them on top of it. So it's a lot of factors. Mm -hmm. That's that's the that's the pathology in them, right? They've they've got loss of uh, uh, the atonia, so essentially um, whatever is inhibiting their muscle activity is not there anymore. So they're essentially waking up and they're enacting in their dreams. All right, thanks.